that your prayer on a somewhat regular basis anyways? That the Lord would do that good work in us, teaching us to love him with our all. We're commanded to do so, and if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that we don't. But thankfully, the one who has begun a good work in us is committed to completing that good work. Amen? That yes, our souls would not be double souls. Amen? We wouldn't be divided in our affections, but we would love the Lord with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Hallelujah. Let's turn in our Bibles this evening over to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. On Sunday morning, we talked of the glory of heaven that awaits us. Amen? The goodness of God. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this 11th verse of Psalm 16 points the way. Amen? Amen? The way to heaven. The way to know the goodness of God the riches of God, the exceeding great and precious promises and all that's been laid up in store for us. I, <clears throat> I speak to this not infrequently, but it is, a, it is a deep comfort to me to know that as your pastor, I can stand before you and speak the word of God. And if you're a believer... The Holy Spirit takes these truths and ministers them to your heart as real. That's his ministry, isn't it? He's the one who leads us and guides us into all truth. He's the teacher. He's the one that takes the truth of the word and he writes it on the fleshy tables of our hearts. What a precious comfort that is to us. Amen? But here in verse 11 of Psalm 16, the scripture reads, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Well, yes, on Sunday morning we were talking about the pleasures, the joy that belongs to us, joy unspeakable and full of glory, the great goodness that God has stored up for us. We have a, a reward that awaits us in heaven. God's good to us in the here and now. And beyond imagination, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, hasn't entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for us. We were, again, joking a little bit after service on Sunday how it's, a, it's <clears throat> amusing to think that, you know, we could have it so good that we would just get, I'm, I'm getting a little weary of, of being always so happy. <laughs> how good the Lord is, amen? How great is goodness. But the first part of this 11th verse says, thou wilt show me the path of life. And the path of life, the path that leads to God, that leads to everlasting life, is the path that Jesus showed us. He's the good shepherd. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. And yes, in John 14, a much loved verse says Jesus saying of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the living word of God, isn't he? He sure is. It's on my heart. I, <clears throat> I also speak to you from time to time that as we're on a particular subject, it's because of conversations that I've had or heard of. And they're sometimes uh, cause, they cause me to, to be aware of needs in the body. I, I recognize that sometimes uh, I speak and there are those that think I'm speaking to you. And, and I want you to know, I am. <laughs> and I trust that all have ears to hear. Because God's got something to say, doesn't he? His word is rich and full. <clears throat> and the path of life is a path that is shown to us in the word of God. Uh, the, the Bible says the word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Amen? It's the word of God, the wisdom of God. When we take time in any one of our services together, you're fellowshipping with a brother or sister, and there's the discussion of the word. You crack open this Bible and you read truths that are inspired by God. They come from the heart of God. This is the living word of God. That's God speaking to us. Like it or not, that's God. And we're responsible. We are. 
Sometimes, you know, there's that, there's that saying uh, in the world that says, uh, ignorance is bliss. No, ignorance is death. Ignorance is not bliss. You don't stand before God and say, oh, I didn't know. And therefore can't be held accountable. You do know. If you're a believer, you know. If you're not a believer, you know enough to give an account before God for your soul. But certainly as believers, those that have entered into a relationship with God and have the Holy Spirit, the teacher, doesn't get any better, better a teacher than him, amen? Jesus says, I'll give you another one like myself, a teacher. Lead you and guide you into all truth. And he does. Are we leadable? Are we teachable? We have ears to hear. He wants to show us the path of life because he wants to bestow upon us life unimaginably wonderful, doesn't he? And you know, the path is not always a pleasant one to, to tread, is it? No. Again, if you were to refer to that 23rd Psalm, the, um, sometimes it's uh, through the valley of the shadow of death, and sometimes it's the table in the presence of my enemies. Not the most pleasant place. I, I prefer the, yeah, Green pastures and still waters. But it's not always that way, is it? No, it is not. But still, the path of life. It's God's way, God's word, God's wisdom. I stand before the people of God from time to time in personal conversation. Or yes, as I say, I hear reports of conversations that, that, uh, that different ones have had. And, uh, and I hear this, or I see that kind of response. And yep, sometimes it's unsettling to me as a pastor who's given account, going to give an account for the souls of the people before whom I stand. And I hear people that, you know, sometimes resist the word of God and aren't so sure they like what they're hearing. Well, again, we have a confidence in the mercy and long-suffering of God. Amen? But we're not ignorant of uh, what's in the flesh either. We need to confront it. We need to be ready as individuals to acknowledge sin in our members, uh, a resistance to the will of God. None of us like the idea of having to do what we're told to do. Do we? I mean, we've all confronted it. <clears throat> and sometimes I think, you know, maybe we'll use the little funny anecdotes, but sometimes I think, well, no, let's not take that time because it's so familiar. We know that sometimes there is in man a tendency to do just the opposite of what he's been told. Why? Because he's been told. It's just in us. True to the Adamic nature, isn't it? Yeah, just to be obstinate and independent and rebellious, self-willed. But thankfully, by the grace of God, we can overcome that. We can see it. Yep, that's nothing short of me just being stubborn. With a capital S and T and so on. <laughs> it's just me. It's in me, and that's what it is, and I see it, and I'm not going to give place to it. By the grace of God, I'll humbly submit to what God's word has to say. Amen? That's the path of life. That's the path of life. <clears throat> Go with me to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. We'll drop in briefly at verse 15, which reads that the way of of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So set over against being a fool and doing what's right in one's own eyes. And frankly, I mean, <clears throat> uh, that's where we live. We do what's right in our own eyes. Well, <clears throat> uh, if we as believers embrace the truth of God's word and allow it to govern our lives, then what's right is God's will. I delight to do thy will, oh my God. It should be our heart, amen? Should be our delight. The commandment should not be a grief. Do you recognize the commandment is a grief to you sometimes? Sure, we all do. But by the grace of God, we deal with it. Amen? And we don't insist on stubbornly remaining a fool, doing what's right in our own eyes. When he says, he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise, I know that as a pastor, I counsel people from time to time. But I'm no therapist. I'm a Christian. And I am a pastor. And yeah, I, I watch for people's souls and I speak into people's lives. 
I teach the word of God. But you all, as able ministers of the gospel, give counsel. You give counsel to one another. You're equipped to do so, aren't you? Or being equipped, you should think of yourselves as being equipped and having a responsibility to stand before God to bring counsel from the word of God to one another. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. What a privilege. Being able to speak words of life into the, the hearts, the whole souls, the lives, the, the matters that brothers and sisters have before them. You bring counsel. And the counsel, of course, is the, the word of God. It's not your perspective. It's not my perspective. It's not what I would want done if I were in your shoes. This is what I, No, it's what saith the scripture. Amen? What's the Bible have to say on the subject? The fool uh, disregards what the Bible has to say and, and uh, adamantly, stubbornly insists on doing what they want to do. Resisting. Just right in the face of sound counsel from the word of God. The, the brother or sister that brings you the word of God uh, does so out of love and from the heart of God. That word carries no less weight than it, if it came from a deacon or a pastor. If it comes from the word of God, the heart of God, it's authoritative. It's true. And Christians receive it as such. And put themselves underneath the authority of that word and the one who gave the word. The fool does what's right in his own eyes, but he that hearkens unto, you might, you could easily say, he that hearkens unto the word of God. He that hearkens unto the spirit of God. He that hearkens unto, unto Jesus' lordship. That's a wise thing to do, isn't it? That's a wise thing to do. To listen to what God has to say. But understand, I, I'm probably in pretty safe ground if I say that there's not a soul here today that has ever heard God speak audibly. But if you're a Christian, you've heard him speak. He's got a voice, and he has made known his voice to you. Wise people hearken unto what their master has to say. They receive it as the word of God. That's God that just talked to me. And we could all sit here today and say, oh, you know, if it was an audible voice, thus I mean, the building shook with the voice of God. You know, the neighbors thought it thundered, but we all heard the voice of God speaking. And would that have a greater impact on us than us picking up our Bibles or... I'll go, I'll go the next one. Sitting in a service like this and God speaks to you or a brother or a sister in conversation talks to you from the word of God. God has his way of communicating, doesn't he? And it doesn't have to be the thunderous, audible voice for his people to hear. His sheep know his voice. They hear it as such. They receive it as such. And they submit in humility before their master, their maker. The fool does what's right in his own eyes. It wasn't booming. It didn't come from this one or that one. You know, pastor, he's never written any books. Oh, he might have he gone to, you know, the Bible college, but he doesn't have his doctorate or... And we can come up with all kinds of Reasons. Well, that's just so-and-so that's speaking. It's the word of God. The word of God. The path of life is a path that's laid out before us in the word of God. This is the way. Walk in it. The fool will continue in his own perspective thinking that he knows better. Having heard the word of God, disregards it because he thinks he knows better. Or the, the, the circumstances that he faces are unique. Or the individual from whom he heard the, the word of God really doesn't know as much as, well, if there is a, dis, if there is a, uh, a disagreement with regard to the matter that comes that's based upon the word of God, well, we've got something to talk about. That is to say, if, if one is brought the word of God by another and 
uh, the person that's bringing that word believes that it applies to the situation. The word of God applies to the situation in life. <clears throat> it's before him. And one says, well, I hear what you're saying, but these, I don't think these principles that you're bringing to me apply. I believe that the, these other principles apply in my situation. Well, now we're talking about it at least from the word of God. At least we recognize that the word of God is the standard. Amen? And we'll go from there. But there are times when you probably found yourselves in situation, if it's situations where you're bringing truth from the word of God to somebody and they're, they're resisting it, but not from the scripture. We got problems now, don't we? Now we're, not now we're nothing close to on the same page. We're not in the same book, are we? No. The word of God's the standard. So if there's going to be discussion, let it be based upon the word of God. Amen? If there's disagreement, then, then uh, let, us, uh, let us look to the word of God for a fuller and clearer understanding of what is written what's in the heart of God, how it applies in this situation, and not be quick to say, I know better. That's what the fool does. That's what the fool does. Proverbs chapter 16. From the New King James, verses 2 and 3. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirits. We have a tendency to justify ourselves and think that I'm okay. Oh, maybe we're comparing our spirituality to, to that of a brother or sister. Uh, more often than not, the standard is our intentions, isn't it? I intend to do, to do good or intend to do better, make some improvement, uh, going forward and we would make some kind of excuse for uh, shortcoming or failure. <clears throat> but God knows my heart, my heart of hearts, and I really do love him even though I'm not doing what he tells me to do right now or my attitude isn't really what it should be right now, but God knows that I really love him. And aren't you thankful for the mercy of God? And I mean that in all sincerity. Aren't you thankful for the mercy and long-suffering of God? But God also knows what he has invested in us when he has given to us his spirit, newness of life. And when he teaches us, he expects us to learn. Never does he require us to learn or, or, or uh, conduct ourselves in a manner that is beyond our ability. He never tries us in that way, does he? Nope. His grace is always sufficient for all that he calls us to. However difficult that might be. And, and we should not be too quick to characterize our walk or what, what we have before us as overly difficult. Because really that is a, a not so subtle indictment against God, isn't it? You with me there? That he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not a very good God to expect this of me, is what we're saying. If he, if he puts it before us, then he knows that he's invested enough of his life, his grace, his wisdom from the word into us to enable us to do what he's put before us. Amen? So we shouldn't say, I can't or it's too hard. Thankfully, those kinds of situations are given to us in the word of God, aren't they? Whether it be a Moses or a Jeremiah or a Gideon like we were reading about the other day, right? I can't, you know, I'm not, I'm not that's not for me. I could never do that. I couldn't take that kind of stand in my home. I couldn't take that kind of stand in this relationship. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, say that to this person or to that one. We ought not to say those things. Oh, how God wants to use his people. God seeks, God seeks his glory, doesn't he? And God gets glory through a yielded vessel. And if he says, you're going to go and you're going to say this to that person, that person could lop off my head. Yep, he may well. Has that power and authority to do so. But you're going to go. That's what I've called you to. And those are the precious Bible stories that we love to read about, aren't they? You know, Esther says, yeah, and if I perish, I perish. Why do we know the story of Esther like we know it? Why do we celebrate her stand? Because of her boldness, her confidence, her trust in God to abandon her own interests for the glory of God. Amen? Or a David. We all love David, that young man going out against the giant. 
zealous for God's holiness. Right? And, and why? I mean, what, do, what is it that we admire about him? His, his total disregard for self. His zeal for God and the glory of God. Amen? So in our little situations, and I don't mean to you know, speak <clears throat> oh, insensitively to the difficulties or the, the complexities of what any, mighty, any one of us here might face. Our, our trials, they're real, they're real to us. And we take a stand on the word of God and, it, and if we do so, it could cost. It could cost if I, if I take this stand before my wife, before my husband, how's this going to come on? How's this going to uh, go over to a brother or sister? If I speak this directly to them, yeah, they might be recovered out of the snare of the devil. Amen? Amen. And you might have the privilege of knowing that you've been used by God as a Vessel of honor. Meet for the master's use and prepared unto that good work. Amen? Yeah. And God gets himself glory when his people move into humble obedience to his word, his ways. <clears throat> the ways, all the ways of a man seem pure in his own eyes. I'm doing okay. I'm all right. Uh, let's not be too extreme. Or I, I think that God understands. And, but the Lord weighs the hearts, the spirits. He knows what's going on inside. His word, again, is that discerner, isn't it? The word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I might try to convince you or convince myself that my way is okay. But God knows. God knows. And sometimes, frankly, it's only God that knows. Because I can see what doesn't look to be good fruit and have concerns, and I might approach you and say, hey, what about this? And I can't plainly say that what you're doing is, shouldn't be done. You get, you know, a brother or sister, you might be the one that's approaching them. And, you know, it sort of doesn't look quite right, doesn't look good, doesn't, the, the, the general direction doesn't seem to be too solid, sound, upright, consistent with the word of God. But I can't plainly, can't plainly say that it's definitely always sinful. You know, you can point somebody toward a higher and holier way, can't you? You with me there? Certainly there's a whole lot about our Christianity that is, our Christianity should be characterized by zeal, fervor, right? The Bible writes, Paul writes to Timothy, stir yourself up. Was well, Paul saying that Timothy wasn't a Christian? Is that what he's saying? No. But Paul recognized that there was room in that man's life for him to be stirred up. More zealous, more fervent, more consecrated. So, what do you, Timothy responds to, are you saying I don't love Jesus? Are you, don't, are you saying I'm just in sin? Are you saying I'm going to hell? I said, stir yourself up, Paul's response. And sometimes we find ourselves in situations like that, don't we? We're just challenging somebody to get more zealous because it looks like they're a little bit lukewarm. Maybe entangled. You know, they talk about anything under the sun but the things of God. Or you talk about the things of God and they want to quickly turn the conversation away from the things of God. Those are indicators, aren't they? People get uncomfortable about talking about Jesus, what the Bible has to say, what the Lord's doing in their life. I don't want to talk about what the Lord, tell me what the Lord's doing. I don't want to talk about what the Lord's doing in my life. Why is that? Why is that? We should be a people who understand that the Lord weighs the spirits and tries our hearts, doesn't he? Our desire May not actively be our prayer, but our desire is that the Lord would search us, know our hearts, try us, and know our thoughts. Amen? We desire truth in the inward parts. We genuinely, honestly desire truth in the inward parts. That God would search and try and know, and purge and purify. Cleanse us from secret faults. Another prayer that's prayed. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts 
will be established. And that's a precious promise right there, isn't it? Commit your works unto the Lord. But again, I am um, in my mind, <clears throat> conversations that we have from time to time, ministry that's brought, counsel that's given. I know that people are going to do with it what they want to do with it. Can we commit our work unto the Lord, everything that we're doing, the decisions that we make, the course that we're on? Nope, God, I know what they just said, but I believe this is, this is your will for my life and this is what I'm doing with all, with all that's within me. Because what you're doing should be done with all your might, shouldn't it? You with me there? You with me? So are you, you so convinced that the counsel that you've received is wrong, that you're going to stand before God and say, God, I heard that, but I don't believe that that's right for me. I believe that this is what's right for me, and I'm going to do it with all my might is unto you. Can you commit to what you're doing that way? Oh, I'm not so sure about that. Sometimes we find ourselves there, don't we? Don't we? Well, yeah, you know, I'm not sure that, uh, but I, I'm sure that what they said is not right, because I don't like that. <laughs> Are we prepared to commit what, we have, what we've got before us under God? Because what's not of faith is sin. You following me? If, we're, if we are confident that what we're doing is what, what, what God has got for us, then we're, we're doing it with our might. God, I'm doing this, and I'm doing it with everything within me as unto you. Because you want to be the best husband that you can be, don't you? Amen? Best father that you can be, best wife that you can be, best mother that you can be, best Christian that you can be, best and brightest and most brilliant light on that job where you work, in your family. So you're committing what you're doing is unto the Lord. Amen? Yep. And asking God to pour out his spirit upon you and use you mightily in that role. But if we can't commit what we're doing as unto the, commit what we're doing unto the Lord with that kind of zeal, why not? Why not? Is there some concern that maybe what we're doing isn't what God would have us do? And if that's the case, then fix it. Repent. Acknowledge it. Amen? You want to walk in that confidence that I'm, I'm committing this to God. And I'm going to give it my all as unto the Lord. And if I'm off, off base and out of line, I am really trusting with everything within me. I'm trusting God to bring that to my attention. And help me know, because I believe that this is what, I'm, what I got before me is the will of God. And that's all I want. I want his will. I don't want my will. I don't want to assert my will. I certainly don't want to substitute my will for his will. I want his will. And I'm committing what I'm doing unto him. And you do that in all humility and frankness and openness before God. But you haven't heard the audible voice. Haven't had, you know, three dreams and a vision. But you believe that what you're doing is based solidly, soundly on the word of God. God's going to direct your path. But if you can't commit what you're doing as unto the Lord. You got serious reservations. I'm not so sure this is God or, you know... <clears throat> I heard what they had to say and I get their point that, that, that what I'm doing might not be sound according to the scripture, but I really want to do this and I would, I'm going to try to convince myself that this is the word of God. Do you find yourself doing that from time to time? I mean, try to talk yourself into believing that what you're doing is the word of God, the will of God. That's dangerous ground to be in. Dangerous territory. Because we know that we should only do what God has for us. And I know that I've been approached and, you know, somebody's challenged me with what I'm doing and, they, you know, I've been uh, uh, brought the word of God and I don't like it. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take a position that, no, that's not the will of God. What I'm doing is the will of God. And, and are you sure? Are you real confident? Because again, I'm, I'm not going to stand before you and tell you no unless it's plain from the scripture. And sometimes, yeah, you might be bringing that ministry to somebody and you can't plainly, but you can put truth out before them. 
And the individual that's on a course needs to do so, needs to pursue that course in faith, committing the work unto the Lord. Amen? And the Lord will establish your thoughts. That's good news. That's good news. Just do it in faith. Amen? In Proverbs chapter 16, it says, it's verse 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's the way we stay, that's the way that we stay far away from. Amen? The one that seems right to a man. That there be sound biblical basis. I know that there are decisions that we, that we make, that we face on a regular basis, and there is no specific thou shalt or thou shalt not. Plenty of those decisions that we have before us. But thankfully, there are plenty of biblical principles that are to guide us in our decision making. Amen? I mean, there are, there are lots of us, and we use the silly little examples of, you know, where do you shop for your groceries? Do you go to Wegmans or do you go to Safeway? You know, oh, geez, I don't know, some, I know some good Christian people who shop at Safeway. But then again, I know some very good Christian people who also shop at Wegmans. Lord, what's your will for me? Well, just fast and pray until you hear an audible voice. <laughs> Sometimes we, we make decisions uh, on the day-to-day -day matters of life, committing our, our decisions unto the Lord. But there are other decisions that, that we face, matters that we face, where there are plain biblical principles that can be brought to bear on a proper course, a right course. Plain biblical principles that would warn us against certain courses. You with me there? And that light should be heeded. Those truths should, should <clears throat> be esteemed, valued, as carrying great weight on the decisions that we make. Amen? Great weight. Ah, no, nah, I'll, I'll let, again, I, I'm going to refrain from using uh, examples. The principles are familiar. Uh, one for your notes, Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? More hope for a fool than for him. We're taught that the, the, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Now we know, that thankfully, God uh, knows. His word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He is, by his word, able to identify uh, wrong thinking, wrong motives, isn't he? He convicts us when we're, when we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing. He encourages us as we do things that we should be doing. Amen? So that we're really not trusting our own heart, or we're not doing what's right in our own eyes. We're trusting the, the word of God, the wisdom of his word, and the guidance that he gives to us by his Holy Spirit. Proverbs 30, verse 12, there is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids lifted up. The way that they think <clears throat> is a right way. Go with me over to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. We should certainly maintain a biblically humble view of ourselves. Biblically humble. Amen? And when I say biblically humble, that's not a feigned humility, but a sincere humility before God, a teachableness, a reverence for God and for the authority that he has established, the person of Jesus Christ, his lordship, the role that his word should play. Amen? We don't think that we know it all. But there are some things that we do know. We're thankful to the Father for what we know. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't have to apologize for that. I want to read the first number of verses from the book of Proverbs. Of course, the, the, the book starts out with uh, uh, several verses describing the, the purpose of Proverbs. Amen? <clears throat> 
And I'm reading these from the NIV. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight. The Proverbs are given for these purposes. God wants us to attain wisdom and discipline. He wants us to understand words of insight. He wants us to understand his ways. He says further on in the chapter, he says what? Turn at my reproof. I'll pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my ways, my words unto you. Doesn't he? If we'll turn from thinking our own way and we'll allow God to be the teacher, he can, he can get some truths across. He can lead us as he desires to lead us. He'll show us the path of life. Amen? It is God's will that we would attain wisdom and discipline. Do you desire to be wise with the wisdom of God? Do you desire to come under the discipline of the word of God? Live a, a disciplined or orderly life across the board. Sometimes we think of personal disciplines, you know, of, of uh, well, personal devotions, perhaps, to the word of God, prayer, studying the word. We think of being disciplined in our eating habits or, our, or the things, that we, you know, the, time, the way we spend our time, you know, I've got to be more disciplined and put down the, the phone, stop checking this and shopping for that and doing this on, 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 on the internet. <clears throat> Disciplined, uh, you know, the, people used to talk of uh, putting down the newspaper. Anybody ever heard of a newspaper? <clears throat> the, um, but, you know, turning off the television, being disciplined, things like that, right? Well, uh, for the Christian, discipline is just living a life that is ordered by God's spirit. We read the word of God and we, we grow in our knowledge of the plan of God for our lives, his purpose, how we should live. And we allow that word to order the way we spend our time, the values that we hold, the, the places that we go, the things that we do. We are disciples. We follow Jesus and we are under his discipline. Amen. So the Proverbs are given to bring about a discipline in our lives. Understanding words of insight. We're to understand. We're to grow in our understanding. The, the youngsters that we bring ministry to, maybe you've got some children and you bring uh, a, a particular instruction to them and you know it's for their good, but you understand why it's for their good to a, a, to a measure or to a degree way beyond what they understand and appreciate. They don't understand why or why not. They don't, they don't understand and appreciate uh, so fully as you do, because you know you're, you're more mature as a parent. You've, uh, you've learned sometimes through the school of hard knocks, you know that you, know, you don't want to do that. You're not going to do that. You will not be allowed to do that. This is what you will do. And you, you um, impose upon them certain disciplines and requirements and restrictions for their well-being, for their good. And as you do so, you know that they will grow in their understanding of why you told them to do what they were required to do when they were young. And they will appreciate it. And they will be able to pass that insight into the wisdom that you gave them, the why behind what they had to do. They'll be able to pass it along to others, won't they? They didn't like it, didn't appreciate it when, when they were first told, didn't understand it, but now they grow. Oh, it's good for me. This is good that I was taught, that I was restricted, that I wasn't allowed to do this, that I was required to do that. This is good for me. The Bible says it's a Proverbs. This is the path of life. Proverbs, the word of God, <clears throat> teach us these ways. The Proverbs, verse 3, are for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair. Well, God's a, a right and just and fair God, isn't he? And he requires righteousness of us. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, says the Bible. Not just the one who claims righteousness, confesses righteousness. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Acquiring a disciplined and prudent life. Forgiving prudence to the simple. Prudence, think of... of uh, <clears throat> Well, you know what? I'll tell you. I brought it along. Prudence. It's the ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason. I like that. This is Miriam Webster's first, first uh, dictionary rendering there. Okay, prudence. 
the ability to govern and discipline oneself by use of reason. Somebody brings you the word of God, they reason with you from the word of God. What's the Bible have to say? So that, that makes it pretty plain. Okay, now what are you going to do? The reasonable thing to do is obey. Amen? If this is what the Bible has to say, I don't have any decisions left. This is what I'm doing. I do what the Bible has to say. Is there anything uh, less uh, foolish, no, more foolish than disregarding the word of God? Huh? I know that's what the Bible says, but that's a foolish, that's a foolish direction to head in, isn't it? The wise and prudent thing to do is to find out with everything that's within us, get wisdom, get understanding, and then apply it, put it into practice, do it with our whole being. That's wise. That's prudent. The ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason. <clears throat> I brought along a couple others because I like them all. I'm, we're getting close to shutting it down, but... Uh, again, from Merriam-Webster's definition of prudence, sagacity or shrewdness, and the management of affairs. That's prudent, isn't it? Yep. I see what we got going on here. And we are able to make good decisions in the management of our, of our affairs, our time, our talents, monies, our relationships. We manage them well, wisely, with discernment. Proverbs show us the path of life. We sit here today and think, well, yeah, that's a, that's a smart way to, to do things the right way. I don't want to be wasting time. I don't want to be doing something that is counterproductive. I don't want to be doing something that is not only detrimental for myself, but that would be harmful toward those around me, people that I care about, people that I love, uh, people that God has uh, joined my life with. I want to be used by God to do them good, to be the best possible example of the believers that I could be before him. I mean, sobering for parents, amen? Am I, am I <clears throat> before God looking to him for the grace to be the best possible example that I could be before my children. Training them up in the way that they should go. I challenge every parent to consider, do I live before God <clears throat> in humility, <clears throat> a life that I can plainly say to my kids, you follow me as I'm following Jesus. Your prayer to God is that you would be the most godly person before your children. Most godly person that your kids know. That your kids grow up and think, man, when I think of godliness, I think of dad and mom. People who fear God, love God, love the people of God, love the work of, of the kingdom. Look for, long for Jesus to return. Hearts that are filled with, with a love for the Lord Jesus an awareness of their indebtedness to, to God. A desire to, to pour themselves out in his service. That, <clears throat> I would argue that that's wise and shrewd and reasonable. Skill and good judgment in the use of resources. Caution or circumspection. Circumspection as to danger or risk. It's all prudence. The word of God, the proverbs of God, uh, give plenty of warnings, don't they? Things to guard against, give no place to, make no provision for. Plenty of warnings. And we're thankful for those warnings, aren't we? Yeah. Don't do this. Don't go down that path. Give no place to those thoughts. Don't give place to that attitude. Sometimes it's just spoken of as, as <clears throat> this is 
This is the kind of attitude, the emotion, the life that is lived by the evil, the froward, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And we are, in those passages, warn us of things not to do or not to give place to in our lives. The... Bible, I think it, it is the, uh, <clears throat> the Thompson chain reference. And there may be found, these, these little headings may be found in um, other <clears throat> editions of the Bible, but I used to use the Thompson chain reference. And the page after page through the Proverbs at the top, it would say, moral virtues and contrary vices. It would talk of just the simple heading of things that are good and upright before the Lord. And those things that God warns us to stay far from. Amen? The path of life. The path of life. God teaches us the right way. He says, this is the way, walk in it. And he tells us of things that, <clears throat> that are found out of that way. So that if we find ourselves coming uh, upon those things, we, we might conclude, okay, looks like I'm out of the way because this stuff is... Uh, I should not be given place to this stuff. I should not be engaging in this stuff. This, I'm out of the way. Proverbs provides that wisdom, that guidance for us. For giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. And then, of course, Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. <clears throat> the Lord does make his voice known to his people. And we stand and give an account. We stand before God Almighty every moment of every day with that awareness that all things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God knows my heart. He knows if I'm, if I'm in love with him. He knows if, I'm, if my sincere, humble desire is to honor him with my all. He knows if I'm pursuing my will, if I'm resisting his will. He knows those things. And I know that he knows. I know that he knows that about me, and he knows that he, I know that he knows that about all of us who are Christians. Doesn't he? And he knows what he has said. He knows what you have heard. He knows what I have heard. He knows all those things. And that's sobering. Comfort, but it's also sobering, isn't it? Yeah. So we're responsible. We're responsible as we stand before God. And thankfully, his grace is sufficient. But we are responsible. We're responsible. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning, isn't it? We fear before him. We consider that the one who made us and who has redeemed our lives with his blood has rightful claim to our all. That's very reasonable. And the Christian understands the reasonableness of that claim. They understand the price that was paid. The Christian understands that <clears throat> I was a dead man. And God, who is rich in mercy, has given to me newness of life. He heard my cry. And now I belong to him. That's the path of life. A path of life. He shows us the path of life. This is the way. Walk in it. This is the way. His word is the way. Jesus is the way. Amen? We'll finish there for this evening. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you that your word illuminates our path. These are not personal opinions and preferences that we preach. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. You govern, you guide, you correct, you encourage.
you require us to obey. You do not force us to obey. But you know what you've spoken. And you know what we have heard. And we are responsible. We do look to you, O Lord God, for grace. To hear clearly. And to fully yield our all in humble submission. Lord, we know that that way is the path of life. And we thank you for all the life that you have provided for us. This is not a hard way. This is not a grief. This is not burdensome. This is the path of life. In your presence, fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. God's grace and peace go with you all.